Parashat Ki Tavo. This is Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1, through Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 8. All right. Everybody repeat after me. Ve-ha-ya. Ve-ha-ya. Beautiful. Now, Brother Yosef is going to be using the more classical type of Hebrew. It's actually more accurate. So if you notice that he pronounces something a little different than me, it does not mean that he's wrong. I, I'm trying to teach everybody the basic pronunciation of Hebrew. So there are two main pronunciations. We'll have the uh, widespread popular pronunciation in modern times that's mostly used in modern Hebrew. And we have the classical ancient pronunciation. If you want to use the ancient pronunciation, Kolakavod, that's wonderful. Um, and, but if you have not yet learned the basic popular pronunciation, I do encourage someone to learn that first. All right, so Wehaya in normal, uh, wide popular pronunciation, Wehaya. Ki Tavo. Ki Tavo. Ki Tavo. Ki Tavo. El. Ha Aretz. El Ha Aretz. El Ha Aretz. Beautiful, beautiful. El Ha Aretz. Kolakavod. Asher. 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 Right, and when you guys repeat, I want you to try to actually read it from the text. Don't just hear me and say the same thing. Okay. Oh. I don't know. What, I don't know what you're because I don't know what's in everybody's minds, but. Uh, so just kind of use me to help you, but also try to read each letter for yourself. Oh, ah, share. share Adonai. Ah, share Adonai. Elohecha. Elohecha. No, Elohecha. No ten. Lecha. Lecha. Na hala. Na hala. Hala. Vi rish ta. Vi rish ta. Vi rish ta. Good. And when you, when you see a hay with the dot in it, you want to exhale very strongly. So instead of virish ta, you want to say virish ta. You should hear yourself. Ta. Ta. All right. Because this right here is a word. This is a word all by itself added to this word. <laughs> all right. Ve yo shabta. Ve yo shabta. Ba. 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 Good, good. Right, we, if you see a dot in the hay, we need to hear the sound of the ta. Okay, let's get someone, just one person. Let's get one person. Kola kabut, good. How about you read to the end of this line? Just this part. Ki. Tawo el haaretz. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Okay, now let's get somebody to read the next line. Someone different. Asher. Asher Adonai Elo Hecha No Ten Le Ha. Beautiful. All right. Every word that you read, anyone in Israel would understand what you said. But we're going to pull it up a notch. So tell me. Uh, and I'm only speaking to Sipora, uh, to who was reading. You said, yes. Elohecha. That is correct. Elohecha. All right. How will we know if this should be Elohecha, if it should be Elohecha, or if it should be Elohecha? Which one should it be? And how do you know? 
Should we emphasize the first part, Elohecha? Should we emphasize the second part, Elohecha? Should we say Elohecha? Or should we say Elohecha? Elohecha. All right, let's say it a little bit more quickly. Elohecha. Good, you did it correctly. Now, how do you know? How did you know you should you should emphasize this part of the word? How did you know it's Elohecha? Good, good. This little cantillation symbol, the what we call in Hebrew the Ta'am, right? That told you that this part of the word is what should stand out. We should hear it the clearest. Elohecha. All right. Now here is it noten or noten? Noten. Beautiful. Okay, call a couple. All right, next line. Someone new, someone different. And remember, whoever reads this, when you see the hay with a dot inside, you need to exhale, breathe out strongly. So for example, normally we would just read this as ba. If there's no dot in the hay, we would normally just read this as ba. But because there's a dot in the hay, we want to hear the hay. So not just ba, but ba. ba. Right? Good. And same thing here. All right. Go ahead. Whoever wants to read this, Bachavod. Please go ahead. Yeah. Beish beta. Beish All right. What what vowels under the yud? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Good. Beya. 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 Shav beta. Beya shav ta. Beta. Right. So this this symbol, the shva, it's called shva under the bet. Shva. Shva. shva sometimes it makes a short e eh sound. But most of the time, it's just silent. So yeah. if you're not sure whether it should be, uh, shav, for example, this could this right here could be read shave or just shav. It could be read either of those ways. But one is right and one is wrong. There's a complicated way to know which way it should be. And we haven't really focused on that yet. Uh, it's not really the time to focus on it yet. So what I recommend is, if you're not sure whether to pronounce the shava, these two dots, if you're not sure whether to pronounce it as a short e eh, or to pronounce it as the as a no vowel, like shav, if we say shav, we're not pronouncing it. It just means end of syllable, end of that part of the word. If you're not sure whether it should be one or the other, just read it as if it's silent, shav, right? S sometimes it might be shav it. But don't, don't assume that. Assume that it's silent unless you know otherwise. Okay, so ve ya shav ta. Ve ya shav ta. Ve shav ta. All right? Ba. 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 Got to exhale. All right. Go ahead. You can read it one more time. Lo, lo, Na ala. Na la. Berista. Berista. Ve ya shavta. Ve ya shavta. Ve ya. We need. We need to hear the Y of the yud. Y like the word yes. Ve ya. Ve ya shavta. Ve ya shavta. Ba. That was beautiful. Okay, now we're going to translate. We're not going to translate the whole thing. I'll, I'll translate it quickly, but then I will get you guys to translate certain words. Vehaya. Haya means it was. All right. The vav here reverses the time. So if haya means was, then this vav makes it and there will be or and it will be. He, when, or if, or that. Here it means when. Tavo, you shall come. So, and it will be when you will come. El, toward, to the land. Aretz, the land. Asher, 
that, which or who? Adonai, the Lord. So that the Lord, Elohecha, your God, noten, gives lecha, to you. Lecha, to you. Now, Allah. Go ahead. What's your question? Noten. Yes, noten means gives, giving. So, and, and it will be that when you will come to the land that the Lord, your God, gives to you. Nahala, an inheritance, as an inheritance. Nahala. We rishtah, and you shall inherit it. This hay with a dot in it means it. It literally means her, because land in Hebrew is female. So they don't have an it in Hebrew. Everything is either he or she. We rishtah, and you will inherit it, the land. We yoshavta, and you shall dwell, you shall sit, bah, in it, in the land. Okay. Who can tell us what Aretz means? Land. Land. If someone does not know what Aretz means, please write it down. It's kind of a common word. Aretz means land. Ha means the. It's very common. So you can write down. If you put ha at the beginning of a word, it means the. So ha Aretz means the land. Word. It can mean world, it can. Usually it just means a certain region. A lot of times in older translations, they might translate Aretz as world. And sometimes it can mean that, but it doesn't necessarily mean the whole world. It, it can, very often it just means a certain region, like India or, um, or like a, what we would call a state. Usually it does not mean the entire world. Okay. El. El means what? This is a trick question. Who can tell us what El means? Two or two words. Perfect. That's exactly what it means here. Uh, who can tell me what I'm trying to trick you guys about since I did not succeed to trick you? <laughs> it's a trick question. So our brother Yosef answered correctly. It means two or toward. But sometimes you might read the word El or hear someone say El in Hebrew and it means something different. No. Mm, not. So if it's a Al, like Al, Aleph Lamed, then that would mean not. Aleph Lamed with a Patach, with this vowel, the line. Yeah. Then, then that would mean, it would mean don't. Don't, uh, don't. Good. Al. We had it here where is it it's somewhere in here i know that in here here it is al with a patach that means don't you shall not all right so el means to or toward with a segot what would it mean if it's a sere if the vowel underneath the aleph is a sere two dots not three it means god Nachon, great, perfect. All right, so who can tell us how many dots when it means God? If you have Aleph Lamed and and you have and it means God, how many dots will be under the Aleph? Two. Nachon, okay, correct, very good. So if it means God, there will be only two dots under the Aleph. If there are three dots under the Aleph, what does it mean? Seiko. Good. Segol is the three dots. So if we have three dots under the Aleph, it will mean two or two. Two or two words. Okay. All right. So to the land or toward the land, Asher. Who can tell us what Asher means? Who? Which, which, which. Beautiful. I mean, oh. which. I mean, that or who. And never as a question. It does not mean which as a question. In English, the way you translate... Oh, there's a... I'm going to have to mute someone temporarily. Okay. So in English, the words which, who, 
those can be questions or a statement. Which one do you want? Who was that knocking on the door? Who are you? So asher can mean who, but it does not mean who is a question. It only means who as a statement. That's the man who I saw yesterday. This is the command uh, which God commanded us. Not a question, just a statement. Who can tell us what noten means? Giving. Beautiful, beautiful. Giving. It's present tense. All right. Who can tell us what lecha means? To you. Nachon, correct. Nachon. Lecha means to you. The lamed means to, and the cha means you. All right. And our last word for the day in this verse. Nachala. Who can tell us what nachala means? It's not a very, it's kind of common, but not super common. The land. So nachala refers to the land, but that's not what it means. It's a portion. I think it's portion. Good. Um, it specifically means like an inherited portion. It means part of an inheritance. <laughs> Excuse me. So if if uh, your father or mother passed away and they had some property and you received that property, then you inherit it. It's your nahala. And usually it's inherited land, right? So it, it can refer to land. And it often does refer to land, but it specifically means something inherited. So, so not normal land. Okay, Kolakavod. I think we analyzed this verse enough for today. Let's go to the Tariag Mitzvot, 613 Mitzvot. Today we're on the sixth Mitzvah. It means to cleave or cling to the sages. All right. Who would like to read the first paragraph? Who would like to read the first paragraph? Can I read? Yes, sir, please. Bechavot. Yosef will read and then the next person. Okay. The sixth mitzvah is that we are commanded to be close to the wise and to associate with them. We should constantly be close to them and to be with them in all possible ways of friendship, such as eating, drinking, and doing business in order to thereby succeed in emulating their actions and knowing from their words, the true way of looking at things. Beautiful. So this is considered a mitzvah of the Torah. We're going to find out that the Torah doesn't actually say cling to the sages. It says cling to God. But because God is not a person, then we understand it to mean cling to those who are close to God. And in that way, we will become close to God. Now, if we were... You can see here how early uh, Christians who did not understand Jewish ways of speaking might mistake this and think, oh, if, the, if we understand cleaving to God to be clinging to sages, then it must be that sages, wise people, are God. But that's not what it means. It just means that uh, humans can represent God, right? So the way we cling to God, who is not physical, and clinging sounds kind of physical, kind of, right? So the way we do it is by we, we draw close to God by drawing close, getting close to people who are also close to God. All right, and, and a beautiful thing about this mitzvah is that it points out something different in the Jewish faith. Uh, unlike, unlike in most governments, the government of Israel are supposed to be righteous people. We're supposed to choose our leaders based on how close they are to God and their knowledge of Torah, not just that they're rich not just that they're influential. And so our leaders, the leaders of Israel, unlike most countries where the politicians, the leaders are kind of like famous people and you can't really get near them because they're above everybody. 
In Torah, it's different. God wants the regular people to be able to be close to the wisest people. We, they, God wants us, the Torah wants that we will be friends with the leaders of our people, that we will eat and drink with them, that we'll interact with the, the wisest people in our country. He does not want that they will be all together alone in a building up in the mountains. You know, he doesn't want that the leaders of Israel will be monks that do not have common interaction with people. Right? So he wants us to be close to his sages. Okay, next paragraph. Can I read? Yes, sir. Go ahead. The source of this commandment is God's statement, exalted be he, and cling to him. The commandment is repeated, to him you shall cling, and is explained in the words of the Sifri, cleave to the sages and their students. Okay. Uh, Sipora, would you like to read this paragraph? Which one? This one that I made all blue. Where? Are you okay? Can you see it? There is no blue. Oh, I I got rid of the blue. Can you see the blue now? No. Uh, yes, no. Our okay. sin is also derived from the verses. To him you shall cling. That one must marry the daughter of a Talmud Chacham. All right, a Talmud Chacham, it means someone who is a student of the sages. Talmud, mm -hmm. Talmud means student, Chacham is the wise person. Okay. So you, can translate, you can translate this two ways. It could be translated as uh, a wise student. It could also be translated as a student of the wise. And a lot of people translate it as Torah scholar, but that's not the literal meaning. Literally, it's just somebody who's a student of the wise or of wisdom. Okay, let's continue. Uh, marry one's daughter to ye, Tamid, Chacham, give benefits to Talmedi, mm Chachamim, -hmm, and do business with them. Our sage says, is it possible for a person to cling to the Divine presence, when the verse says, God, our Lord, is like a consuming fire. Rather, whoever marries the daughter of a Talmud Chacham is considered to have claim to the divine presence. All right. So again, we have an example where if someone uh, just picks up Jewish literature and does not study it carefully, and they just read a little bit here and there, they could read this and be like, oh, so if cleaving, if joining or marrying a Tamir Hacham is like, is like attaching yourself to the divine presence, then a Tamir Hacham must be God, right? But that's a mistake. And so we can see in, in this kind of terminology how uh, some early Christians misunderstood Jewish teachings. Like we said yes. earlier, uh, and I, I think you all know that I do not consider the New Testament to be the word of God. I don't consider it to be the word of God at all. But it did come from uh, Jew, er, Jews 2,000 years ago and some people who were influenced by Jews. So, for example, where it says uh, a lot of people try to say that Jesus is God because it says in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it says the word became flesh and basically that was Jesus. So they say, oh, look, Jesus is God. But if you understand, for example, what we said about the word devar just a moment ago, devar can mean several things. Usually it's translated as word, right? Uh, we know that the oldest copies we have of John is in Greek, but we also know that... Uh, Jesus and the apostles knew Hebrew and spoke Hebrew. Um, so they're translating Jewish concepts into Greek. So the word davar, usually translated as word, 
um, can also mean matter or topic or thing or message. If you translate in the beginning was the word as in the beginning was the message and the message was with God. And what was the message? God was the message. God was what was going to be revealed. So then if you say, and the message became flesh, right? So then it's not so much that the message is literally God, but it's that the message reveals God, that the message represents God. The same way when I could say that I see your name flashing on my screen because we're on Zoom and when you talk, I see your name pop up. And I could say that name is a message and that message is Tsipora or that message is Yosef. But I know that this name on my screen is not actually Yosef. It's just symbolizing Yosef. It's just symbolizing Tsipora, just representing Right, but the Christians misunderstand all this stuff, and we need to help them. Okay, so it's a Torah commandment that we cleave to God, and one of the main ways we do that is by uh, getting close to people who love God, who study His Torah. All right, laws of Shema. We finished last week with the first halacha, the first law of chapter four. Of the laws of Shema. I think it's good that we reread it. Would someone like to read this? Women slaves, women slaves and children are exempt for the Piyat Shema. We should teach children to recite it and uh, at the proper time with the blessings before and after it in order to educate them regarding the commandments. Okay, so this is really what I wanted you guys to see. Technically, women, wives, children, and servants, uh, non is well, they are kind of Israelites, but, uh, but they're not, that's a status we haven't learned about. Slave is not the best translation. So Israelites, servants, or slaves are not non-Jews, but that's a whole different topic. Ooh. We could talk about that some other time if you bring it up, uh, and I'll explain more. So women and children are not required to recite Shema. But we also see here that even though children are not required to recite Shema, we still teach them to do it, right? Because eventually they will be required. They will be capable uh, to understand and obligated in it. There are there's a general idea that any commandment that is restricted by a certain time women are not obligated in it uh, but we do see some ex exceptions to this and there is a view it's not the mainstream view but there is a view that the reason why women are not obligated to do these things is because the function the role or the purpose you know, what husbands and wives usually did traditionally were very different things. And this was necessary. It's still necessary depending on the circumstances, the situation. So, for example, women traditionally were the main people who helped take care of little children. Husbands also helped, but the women did most of that. They also cooked most. Uh, obviously, in the Western world, this is not so much the case anymore. It's all mixed. Um, but because women were more focused on cooking and taking care of children, to obligate them in these other things would be too much for them. They just simply, it's too much. You know, a person cannot do everything. But this is not to say that a woman is not allowed to do these things. She's certainly allowed to. The point that we should remember in this, though, is that there are priorities. There are things that are more important than other things. So for example, it's, it's very good that uh, if I pray all day long, is prayer a mitzvah? Is prayer a commandment of God? Yes. So if I as a man pray all day long, okay, I was doing a commandment all day long, right? But there are other commandments that God commands me to do that take priority, that I should do first right? Only after I've taken care of those other things, then if I want to, I pray the whole day. 
if I wanted to. So the main idea is that a person should take care of what they are obligated in most strongly. So a, a, a woman should not uh, neglect taking care of her children because she's has feeling like she needs to say Shema. But if her children are a little bit older or if they're asleep and she's done everything else she needs to do, then if she wants to say Shema, that's a wonderful thing. She's doing a mitzvah if she says Shema. But there's priorities. So first things first. Okay. Uh, I do apologize if I'm too long-winded. Uh, next halacha. Next uh, paragraph. Would anyone like to read the next paragraph? Okay, I will read. Go ahead. Okay, so we okay. see we see that what we said about women, it, the same concept is kind of true for everybody. That's what this next paragraph is going to say. One who is preoccupied and in an anxious, anxious state anxious. regarding anxious, anxious state regarding a religious duty is exempt from all commandments, including Tariyat Shema. Therefore, a bridegroom whose bride is a virgin is exempt from Tariyat Shema until he has consummated the marriage because he is distracted lest he not find her a virgin. All right. Uh, let's skip this part because it's basically just giving more examples and giving an exception. And we read it last week. Okay. Uh, number two. However, one who marries a woman who is not a virgin is obligated to recite the Shema because even though he too is involved in the performance of a mitzvah, it is not so distracting. The same principle applies to similar cases. All right. And these halachot are general concepts. There could be an exception. This halacha is saying generally. Generally, a person is not distracted. He's not going to be all anxious if he's uh, marrying someone who's not a virgin. But if he is, if he is anxious in any situation so that he's so distracted he cannot focus, then he's exempt. And exempt just means he's no longer obligated in. But it's temporary. Temporarily not obligated. I mean, is exempt. In Hebrew, that is patur. Patur. So we have the words mutar, permitted, asur, forbidden, and patur, exempt. Okay. Halakha shalosh. One who is bereaved of a relative for whom he is obligated to mourn is exempt from Tariyat Shema until he has buried him because his attention is distracted from reciting the Shema. All right, this word bereaved means in pain because of some kind of loss of life. So if someone passed away and it hurts a lot, you don't have to worry about saying Shema. All right, but this is only until uh, the person's, only until the person's no longer distracted. If they're able to focus, uh, then they should say it. Uh, Akhi, can I ask one question? Of course. Uh, can we recite Shema in the graveyards? I don't want to answer that because I can give you what I what I recall, but I haven't reviewed those laws in a, in a good while, so I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. But if I remember correctly, I think if you are at least four cubits, which is about, uh, a cubit is like from the tip of your finger to your elbow. If you are about four cubits away from a grave, then you're allowed to say it. I'm pretty sure that's what the halakha is. Okay. But inside the graveyard, when we reach uh, inside the graveyard, yeah. So it is allowed to uh, recite Shema in, in the graveyards or outside the graveyard. I believe you're allowed to do it inside the graveyard. 
as long as you're at least four amot away from the grave. Four okay. cubits. It's about five feet. I, I could be wrong about that, so I don't want you to, to don't think that's exactly right. I, okay. I need to check that. Okay, okay, okay. okay. No problem. All right, I'll try to give you an answer for that afterwards, okay? No problem. No problem. All right, next paragraph. Can I read? Yes, please. The Chavod. A person who is watching the body is also external, even if it is not the body of a relative. When there are two watch watches, one should continue watching while the other withdraws and recites the Shema. When the latter returns to the other, should depart and recite the Shema. A graveyard, grave digger is also exempt for Kriyat Shema. All right, thank you very much. All right, Halakha Arba. A body should not be taken out for burial close to the time for reciting the Shema unless the disease was a great man. If they, if they do begin to remove the disease, and the time for reciting the Shema arrives while they are accompanying the body. Anyone requires to carry the coffin, the bearers of the coffin, and the replacement of, and those who, is, who in return relieves and replacement, whether they are before the coffin or after it, are extended for Kriya Shema. The rest of those accompanying the body who are not required to carry the person are obligated to recite the Shema. Thank you. Call a kabot. Who would like to read this halakha? Halakha Hamesh. Should they be involved in elogies? Eulogies. Eulogies is just the word in English for when people are crying about uh, someone who died, but usually with work, not just crying, it doesn't only mean crying. It means crying, but with words about that person, about how they miss that person, how good of a person they were, how sweet they were. Th that's what's called eulogies. Eulogies. When the time for Kiriya Shama arrives, if they are in the presence of the disease, they should withdraw singly and recite, and then return to the LOC. If the disease is not present, all the people should recite the Shama except the mourner, who remains silent because he is not obligated to recite the Shama until he buries his relative. Okay. After the burial, the mourners return to receive condolence and the people follow them from the gravesite to the place where they form a line to receive condolences. If the people are able to start and finish even one verse of Kiriya Shama before they arrive at the line, they should do so. If not, they should not start until they have consoled the mourners. Right, because it's a mitzvah, it's a, a commandment to comfort mourners. After they have taken their leave, they should commence reciting. Though standing in the inner line, that is, they can see the faces of the mourners are exempt from Kiriya Shama. Those at the outside, since they cannot see the mourner, are obligated to recite the Shama where they are. Okay. Would anyone else like to read? Halakha Sheva, the seventh halakha. Anyone, uh, anyone who has an exemption from Kriya Shema, but 
never let never the lesser ain't chapu nevertheless it means like uh, anyway nevertheless nevertheless never nevertheless Nevertheless, you're saying it fine. You're saying it correctly. Yeah, desires to to be straight with himself and recited. May do so. This is conditional upon the uh, condition. Conditional, uh, conditional upon the fact that his mind is not distracted. However, if this exempted person is in a confused state he is not permitted to recite the shama until he composes himself okay so hazal the sages of the of the mishnah and the talmud they just gave us some of the common examples of when a person might be so distracted not able to focus that they're exempt from shama that they do not have to recite shema as long as they are distracted and confused right but if they're in that situation where the sages said you don't have to do it they don't have to do shema but if they're not distracted if they are able to focus they are permitted to recite shema as long as they can focus but if they are still distracted if it's still difficult for them to focus then they are not allowed and that's true for anything so the sages hazal only gave examples but this is true for anything if you have a new job that you are starting tomorrow completely new job you never met the boss and you're very worried and anxious absolutely like i would say definitely say an extra prayer to god maybe it will calm you down you could definitely pray in your own words but with regard to the shema you're you're not permitted to say shema if you're that anxious if you're that confused and distracted so there are many different situations that this could apply okay so we will begin with halakha 8 next week we'll do maybe one halakha of uh we'll do it. we'll do two or three uh If anybody wants to go feel free to go. I know we're doing longer than normal. So halakha 6 is where we left off last week. Halakha 6 of chapter 1 and the laws mm-hmm. of de'ot, character tree. So let's review it. Go ahead. Our sages got the following explanation of this mitzvah. Just as he is called gracious, you shall be gracious. Just as he is called merciful you shall be merciful just as he is called holy you shall be holy in a similar manner the prophets called god by the other titles slow to anger abundant in kindness righteous just perfect almighty powerful and the like they did so to inform us that these are good and just parts a person is obligated to uh a, a, a resemble resemble oh a custom i'm sorry a person is obligated uh, to a custom a custom himself to these parts and to try to resemble him to the extent of his ability All right. So God only asks of us to do to the amount we are able. God does not ask us to do more than what we are able. So if we're trying to do something that's just impossible for us to do, we should not get angry at ourselves because God does not command us to do more than we are able. Uh I want to comment about this word perfect. It can be a misleading word. Uh the word there are two words that are often translated as perfect, shalem and tam. and neither of these words mean perfect in the sense of without fault or without mistake god does not make a mistake but humans do make mistakes shalem and tam they don't mean never make mistake what they mean is whole whole or complete and the idea is giving your whole heart 
or giving your complete heart to God, right? To, to be wholehearted is the English word. To be uh, sincere in what we're doing. Okay, halacha sheva. How can one train himself to follow these temper, temperaments to the extent that they become a permanent picture of his personality? He should perform, repeat, and perform a third test. The acts would conform to the standards of the middle road temperament. He should do this constantly until these acts are easy for him and do not present any difficulty. Then these temperaments will become a fixed part of his personality. Anybody else would like to read? Yes. Since the creature is called by these terms and they make upon the middle path, which we are obligated to follow this path, is called the path of God. This is the heritage which our patriarch Abraham taught his descendant as Genesis 18:19 states, for I have known him so that he will command his descendant to keep the path of God. One who follows the path brings benefit and blessings to himself as the above verses continue so that God will bring about from Abraham all to all that he promised. All right. Okay, so that ends this chapter. Uh, let's read the <laughs> first chapter of the next, of the next, I'm sorry, let's read the first halakha of the next chapter. Where is it? There it is, over here. And then that will be it for today. Okay. Who would like to read the first paragraph of chapter two in his thoughts de out? Goodbye. Can I read? Bachavot. To those who are physically sick, the bitter taster sweet and the sweet bitter. Some of the sick even desire and crave that which is not fit to eat, such as earth and charcoal, and hate healthful food, such as bread and meat, all depending on how serious the sickness is. You can read one more. Similarly, those who are morally ill-desired and love bad traits hate the good path and are lazy to follow it, depending on how sick they are, they find it exceedingly burdensome. All right. Would anyone like to read the next paragraph? Yeah. Isaiah 5.20 speaks of such people in a like manner, both to those who call the bad good and the good bad, who takes darkness to be light and light to be darkness, who take bitter to be sweet and sweet to be bitter, concerning them, Proverb 2, 13 states, those who leave the upright path to walk in the way of darkness. What is the redemy for a morally ill? They should go to the wise, for they are healer of soul. They will heal them by teaching them how to acquire proper track until they return them to the good path. Concerning those who recognize their bad track and do not go to the, to the wise to heal them. Solomon, Proverbs 1, 7, 6, said, full sound wisdom and correction. Okay. And who would like to read the next, next paragraph? I. Okay. How are they to be healed? We tell the worthful man to train himself to feel no reaction even if he is beaten or cursed. He should follow this course of behavior for a long time until the anger is uprooted from his heart. The man who is full of pride should should cause himself 
to experience much disgrace. He should sit in the lowliest of places, dress in tattered rags which shame the wearer, and the like, until the arrogance is uprooted from his heart and he returns to the middle path, which is the proper path. When he returns to this middle path, he should walk in it the rest of his life. One should take a similar course with each of the other rites. A person who saved in the direction of one of the extremes should move in the direction of the opposite extreme and accustom himself to that for a long time until he has returned to the proper path, which is the midpoint for each and every temperament. All right. Thank you very much. So we will end with that for today. Let's say our, our final uh, prayer. You can say after me if you want. We're not going to analyze every word. We're just going to say it. Um, and after we get this one, we've learned this first one that we say at the beginning really well, then we will spend time in the future analyzing this one. Okay. Mode ani lefanecha. Adonai Elohai. Adonai Elohai. She Samta Helki. She Samta Helki. Me Yoshve. Me Yoshve. Beth Hamid Rosh. Beth Hamid Rosh. The Law Samta. Helki, Mashkimim. Mashkimim. Ani mashkim. Ani mashkim. Le divre tera. Le divre tera. Vehem mashkimim. Vehem mashkimim. Tidvarim. Tidvarim. Betelim. Betelim. Ani Amel. Ani Amel. Vehem Amelim. Vehem Amelim. Ani Amel. Ani Amel. Um Kabel. Um Kabel. Sahar. Sohar. Vehem Amelim. Vehem Amelim. Vehem Mekabelim Sohar. Mekabelim Sohar. Ani Ross. Ani Ross. Vehem Rossim. Vehem Rossim. Ani Ross. Ani Ross. Le Haye. Le Haye. Ha Olam Haba. Ha Olam Haba. Vehem Rossim. Vehem Rossim. Liv Er. Okay. Now, I, I, I'll say it in English. I'm grateful before you, Adonai Elohai, Lord my God, that you placed my portion among those who dwell in the Beit Midrash, in the house of study. And you have not placed my portion among those who dwell on street corners 
For I arise early, and they arise early. I arise early to words of Torah, and they arise early to matters or things that are empty. I work hard, and they work hard. I work hard, and I receive a reward. They work hard, and they do not receive reward. I run, and they run. I run to life <laughs> of the world to come. And they are running quickly. They run to a pit of destruction. But God arouse our hearts to a love for fellow man, for all humans on earth, to draw them to your love and to run with us to your glory and to everlasting life. Amen. 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 All right. You yeah, guys amen. have a wonderful yeah, week. Shabbat shalom. 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 Uh, may you be written in the book of life. Amen. If you guys want to say after me, Ha Chaim. Ha Chaim. There you go. Ti Katvu Basefer Ha Chaim. Ti Katvu Basefer Ha Chaim. Ha Ha Chaim. Ha Chaim. There you go. I'll write it for you in the chat. It's something that we say going up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. May you be written in the Book of Life. Uh, yes, sir, brother, you write this line in the group. I will. I will. Okay, you. you guys take care. Birkat Hashem Aleichem. God's blessing be upon you. Shalom and Shalom. 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 Shalom.